please welcome Bill Goldman, the distinguished visitor to our department this semester. He'll be given three lectures this week in our class on geometry. <coughs> also tonight, he's giving the public lecture in King 306 at 7.30, so I hope you can attend then. Thank you very much. So what I'll be discussing in, <coughs> in this class will be the introduction to the theory of geometric structures on manifolds. And as you're um, studying Ratcliffe's book, I'll be discussing material from chapters 8 and chapter 9 of the book, geometric manifolds and geometric surfaces. So in addition to hyperbolic geometry, Euclidean geometry and spherical geometry, I'd like to give some examples and discuss the classification of, say, hyperbolic structures with singularities, affine structures, projective structures, and formal structures. So this will be a, a little mini course on um, the classification and the theory of geometric structures on, on low dimensional manifolds. So <clears throat> since you've been studying them, um, Hyperbolic geometry and Euclidean geometry, let me begin with those. And I'll think this is an opportunity to introduce some of the topics that are in more standard differential geometry courses, such as um, Riemannian metrics and connections. So let me begin with what I think is sort of a basic example, and that's the question of um, Euclidean structures on the sphere. So what the sphere is just the unit sphere in Euclidean space. And I want to think of that as a topology. So by that I mean there's a notion of nearness so that every point has a notion of neighborhood and sets which are balls, and then we have every point lies inside a bunch of these open neighborhoods. And we'd like to put on some kind of geometry, such as the geometry of Euclidean space, so we might have a plane. <clears throat> so that'll be R2 with Euclidean geometry on it. So what do I mean by Euclidean geometry on plane? Well, in the subject of Euclidean geometry, we have given two points in the plane, we know how to compute the distance between them. <coughs> if we have two curves, two lines, then we have a notion of the angle between them. If we have a region in the plane, we can talk about its area. And all of these different concepts are connected by um, theorems in Euclidean geometry. So for example, one theorem in Euclidean geometry is that if you have a triangle, then the sum of the angles of the triangle is 180 degrees with high radians. And part of the reason for that is that we have a strong control over parallelism. So uh, by choosing one side of the triangle, the opposite vertex, there's a unique line that's parallel to that side that goes through the vertex. And then through various theorems in Euclidean geometry, this angle is equal to this angle. This angle is equal to this angle, and three angles add up to higher, higher radians. And so what I'd like to say is that um, we know how to compute in Euclidean geometry very well. We like it. And so if we have, say, the sphere as a model for our planet, then we'd like to be able to put Euclidean geometry on the two-sphere. 
The topology is just a loose organization of points. But it's not just a collection of points, but the point, but the points are organized into open sets. We can talk about convergence of sequences. We can talk about continuous functions. There's still enough structure that there's a, a rich mathematical subject. On the other hand, if we just have the points organized into a topology, we still can't really talk about the distance between two points. Or even what a, we can talk about a continuous curve, but we can't really talk about a differentiable curve at this point. So how would we go about putting Euclidean geometry on the two-sphere? So, so th this is an idea which <coughs> I think, well, the basic idea will be that we have an atlas of coordinate patches. So we have open sets, which I'll call patches. And the patches are going to be mapped in you know, geometric space by the coordinate charts. Okay. And so the picture should be that we have two coordinate patches. Each one is mapped into, so here's the topology, which I'll call um, sigma. And here's the geometry, which I'll call x. So we have an open set in to an open set over here in X. And we'd like to take the geometry of X, Euclidean geometry, and put it on the um, surface X. So there's no problem in doing that. We'll assume that this map, I'll call this map, <coughs> Side. This would be the coordinate chart. We'll use this to define coordinates on this patch in the topology sigma. Now, what we'd like to know, we 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 know that we can't find a single patch on the two-sphere. There's just too much room and the space is too curved to have to support just one coordinate patch into the plane. So we all have typically two overlapping coordinate patches. And that we mapped into two sets over here in X. Now there's a region of overlap, an intersection of the two coordinate patches, which in the first coordinate chart, let me give these things names, let me call this one, this will be psi 1, this will be psi 2, and this coordinate patch here I'll call U1, this will be 2, and the images will be Psi two of U two, psi one of U one, and this overlapping region will map into one region under psi one and another region under psi two. There's no guarantee in general that the um, geometry that psi 1 gives to this region <coughs> is the same as the geometry that's given by psi 2. So how do we ensure that will happen? We need to assume that there's a transformation, which I'll call G12, such that, let's see if I take G12 and compose that with psi 1, that equals psi 2 
the intersection. And let me assume that this intersection, U1 intersect U2, is connected. Otherwise, there might be different transformations on different connected components. So these two have to be equal. And that's assuming that G12 preserves the geometry. So in our example, when X is Euclidean space, or X is Euclidean geometry, what does it mean to preserve the geometry? What are the transformations which preserve the geometry on the Euclidean geometry of the plane? Isometry. Isometries. So let's assume in this example that these are isometries. So this leads to our first theorem, which I think is familiar to all of you. Many different proofs that the um, two sphere admits no Euclidean structure. In other words, there is no metrically accurate. think of the, the earth as being, the surface of the earth as being a two sphere, then we can't cover it by patches where we have, where each patch has a chart, which is a um, Euclidean isometry. Now I'm not assuming anything about the geometry of the two sphere. I'm just, I'm just discussing the topology. So this, we're using this collection of charts to define it a local geometry on the sphere. Okay, so. so as I mentioned, this is a, um, there are many different ways of proving this theorem. of a surface that does have a Euclidean structure. Like uh, well, the cube. Well, the cube. So I'm thinking of the cube as the topology, the loose organization of points. And if you're on, if you live on a cube, on a specific <coughs> cube, and you're willing to just deform it continuously, it's the same as the two sphere. You can just sort of round off the corners and the edges, and these are these two are homeomorphic. On the other hand, each face, and each edge, and each vertex does have a nice Euclidean representation. So this would be a piecewise Euclidean structure. But the pieces are, are there. Well, there's a, there's a sort of a, a cheap answer to this question. And that's that um, Euclidean space itself has a Euclidean structure. So R2 is Euclidean space, so that has a, a Euclidean structure. So here, the, you just have one patch that's all of Euclidean space, and the chart is just the identity map. 
But the identity map is kind of, maybe it's a bit misleading because we want to think of the target as having <coughs> geometry and the source as having just topology. So we're sort of strength imparting structure. So this is sort of cheating. But it does answer the question. One of the nice things about the two sphere is that it's compact. So I don't know if you discussed the notion of compactness and topology, but it means that the surface is closed and bounded. So if you have a sequence of points on the two sphere, then you can always find a subsequence which converges. So this sequence always accumulates. Whereas on Euclidean space, you can go off to infinity and find sequences that diverge. That every, then every subsequence will diverge, so it never accumulates. So since we've, are, since we've answered the question in general, let's make it harder by changing the question. And by changing the question, we'll require that this surface be compact. So what's an example of a surface that's compact besides the two-sphere? What's an example of a surface which is cubed, closed and bounded? Well, well that's, that's the same as homeomorphic. Yeah. A circle. Excuse me? What is a circle? A circle is one-dimensional. A torus? A torus. A torus is like the surface of a donut or a bagel, inner tube. You can draw it like that. And this surface is not homeomorphic to the two-sphere. You can't continuously deform the points on a torus into the points of a two-sphere without introducing some tears, without ripping the surface apart or having to let it intersect itself. And an interesting theorem is that the, two tor the torus itself I'll just draw a picture like that and then later we'll talk about how to understand it. Is that the um, two torus does have has a Euclidean structure. And in fact it has many of them and the um, classification of them is extremely interesting. <coughs> and what I'd like to describe in these three lectures is that from this point of view of taking a topology and a geometry, and at this point I've only talked about one geometry, one's led to an interesting space, the deformation space, which you can read about in Ratcliffe's book in these two chapters, which itself has a fascinating geometry. And so the surfaces and the geometries may, well, in general, have a lot of symmetries. But then the space of geometries will itself have a lot of geometry on it and a lot of symmetry as well. OK, so how would one go about putting a Euclidean structure on a torus? How do we understand the torus? Well, one way of understanding a surface is to cut it up into easier pieces to understand. And let's cut the torus up by, first of all, cutting it along this curve here. So imagine taking a, a donut and then cutting it across. And then when you cut it across, you have this circle here becomes two circles over here, and then they're joined by curves like that forming a cylinder. Okay. And so we want to identify one side to the other. Okay. So now we have a different surface. Now this surface has a boundary, and the boundary is disconnected, it has two connected components, and there's an identification of the two components so that when you form the identification space, they match up and they glue together to get this torus. 
so this is a topological construction. I'm just thinking, I'm not putting any kind of metric structure or geometric structure on the torus. I'm just thinking of this as a collection <coughs> of points that are, <coughs> that are covered by open sets. So we have a notion of closeness, a notion of continuous, a notion of convergence. Okay, well, all, the cylinder is okay, but it's still a little bit more complicated than I'd like. So let's cut the cylinder along a curve, an arc like that. Okay, and now when we cut the cylinder along this arc, that arc splits into two arcs, that are both joined by arcs. So each of the endpoints of the red arc cuts the green boundary component into, t into an arc, so it looks like that. So the top arc, when you identify now by transformation like this, these two endpoints of the green arc get mapped to a single endpoint that lies on the single endpoint of the the side of the red arc. And then similarly we have another piece down here. Okay, so we can think of the torus as on our identification space of the square. Where we have an identification of the two sides like that. And one way this is often drawn in the shorthand is that we put arrows on the boundary components to indicate that they're identified. That's a nice picture of what our torus looks like. A nice topological description of the torus. So that's the topology. Are there any questions? So let me just review a little bit about what we, this looks like and for all the other picture. So we first take the torus, we cut it <coughs> along one curve here. That decomposes it in as a cylinder with two boundary curve circles identified. And then we cut it along an arc going from one circle to the next to get a rectangle or a quadrilateral. And so there are two identifications that are being made. Let's go back a little bit. When we cut it along this arc here, that arc corresponds to a curve on the original torus that goes around like that. Okay. So if we want to go backwards from this picture here, there are going to be three types of points on the torus. There are points that are in the interior of the quadrilateral. Those are points that are off of these two curves. And each one of them has a neighborhood, which is a ball, like that. And that maps into a, just a, <coughs> a ball in the interior of the rectangle. There are other kinds of curves, too. There are other kinds of points. You have a point that's on, say, the, red, the interior of the red interval. It has a neighborhood that looks like this. And then when we decompose it, that point will have one neighborhood that's up here, and then another, it has a partner that it's identified with down here. Each of these has a half ball as a 
neighborhood, and then when you make the identification, these two half balls identify to give a whole ball. And that's how we get open neighborhoods, a point on this red arc. Exactly the same picture holds for points on the interior of the green arc. Here we have a tiny open neighborhood here, which is mapped, decomposes into a half disk here. <coughs> this point decomposes as two points that are opposite as arc groups, and the, they have neighborhoods that, that are half balls they had like that. Finally, there's the one vertex. That's where the red curve and the green curve intersect. That point, well, that point decomposes as two points here. And then when you cut it along the red curve, that decomposes as all four points, the vertices of the quadrilateral. The neighborhood will then have four quarter ball neighborhoods, which are the vertices inside this quadrilateral. And then when we do the two gluings, these four <coughs> quarter balls all identify and give you a whole single ball over here. So that's the description of the topology of the torus as an identification space. Okay, so that's this side. The loose organization. Now, how do we put geometry on it? <coughs> so that means that every point on the torus, of which we've distinguished four types, each one has to have a coordinate patch. So the coordinate patches could be these neighborhoods that I described here. They're all mapped into the geometric space. And that'll tell us how to put coordinates on these four different types of points. So we need to be able to put some geometry into this topological discussion. So how do we do that? Well, we want to be able to go from points that have different coordinate patches, competing coordinate systems, and we want the competing coordinate systems to be equivalent by isometries to give rise to the same geometry. And so one way of doing that would be to assume that the different coordinate systems are related by translations. So the translations are very nice Euclidean isometries, those for which the differential, the derivative, is the identity. Okay. So let's realize this like here, that this topological quadrilateral is actually a parallelogram, that the opposite faces, the opposite sides, are parallel translates of each other. So this curve down here, which has two red faces, two red sides, and two green sides, is a parallel over. So the two green sides, the top and the bottom, are parallel, and the two red sides, the left and the right, are parallel. Okay. And so what I'm describing is called the fundamental domain. And so if we take a copy of this parallelogram and translate it by the translation that takes the red side to the, the, the left side to the right side, we get another parallelogram. <coughs> Similarly, if we apply the translation in the downward direction that identifies the top to the bottom, we get another parallel <coughs> with that. 
going and we get a tile end of the line. By a congruent parallel across. Okay. And so now we can identify can find us an atlas, find a Euclidean atlas. As follows. First of all, any point that doesn't lie on one of these curves, so that will be mapped into the interior of, let's start with this one up here, that will be mapped into the interior of the space. Let's take a point which now lies on one of the um, edges. And what will its coordinate look like? So if the point lies on the um, green curve, so that will say I'll map over to this point here. Well, this point, as we just said before, <coughs> is. Um, really corresponds to two points when we decompose it topologically. So this point that has a green, that lies on the interior of the green curve, has two neighbor, has two pre-images that are getting identified under the re-identification. And each of these points has a half-disk neighborhood which glue together to get here. So that's over here. This point here is identified at this point. Has one piece of the neighborhood that's here, and one piece of the neighborhood that's here. Well, that's not really so good because this point here has neighborhood that's a disk. So we correct that by taking this half disk neighbor here on the top and apply a um, vertical translation to add on this point here. So that now gives us a nice neighborhood. The other side will be on the purple here for points of that type. Same discussion applies to points that are on the interior of the red curve. It has a neighborhood that decomposes into two half disks. Over here, that's represented by these two points here. This point is identified to this point, and the two half disks are identified. Over here, we might have a point like that. We'll have half the neighborhood will be here. The other half will be over here. And to get a neighborhood for this coordinate system here, we apply the red translation backwards to correct it by applying, translate this piece here over here to give a neighborhood of this homomorphism. And finally, the most interesting case is when we have a point that's on the intersection of the two curves. That point will, first of all, decompose to two points on the boundary of the cylinder. And then when we cut the cylinder into the quadrilateral, it will correspond to the four vertices of the quadrilateral. And each one of those points has a quarter disk neighborhood, all of which, which get identified to a full disk here. So let's say start use this point here is the image of the coordinate patch that has a neighborhood here, it has three partners corresponding to three other vertices. And to be able to get a good coordinate chart for this point here, we translate this quarter disk down by the vertical translation, this one over here by the horizontal translation, this one here by the composition of the horizontal and vertical translation to get a coordinate chart at this point here. 
this describes a Euclidean atlas for this torus. So this gives us a way of putting Euclidean geometry onto this, <coughs> onto this topology here. So what are the essential points in this construction? So we have realized the topology <coughs> as an identification space. simpler description of the space. And now we can, this torus is, it's, it has a property that you can't really map the whole torus into the plane. This is actually a consequence of compactness, but you can imagine that if you took a torus or even a sphere, anything that's compact, if you mapped it in, you'd have one of the coordinates would have a maximum. So any continuous function on a compact space has a maximum. So at that maximum, you couldn't there have to, it's a, you couldn't have a homeomorphism by jet. So that's why we're cutting the torus up as a square into, into a parallelogram, and this parallelogram can be embedded inside the plane. Okay. The extra freedom we get is that we can now realize the topological identification. geometrically but isometries. And I'll just maybe emphasize that the resulting So in other words, the two half balls surrounding A and red point. So I have to control that. <coughs> These things glue together to give a single. This is the more complicated one. I don't nicely here. So in each case, the point is sound surrounded by a disk, and the disk is a Euclidean disk. 
structure on a torus. Nine more minutes. <laughs> so what can we do with this Euclidean structure now that we have it? For example, can we make this torus that we've described rather thoroughly into a metric space? So how would we define the distance? If we take two points, like maybe this point <coughs> and this point, how do we find how do we find the distance? How do we define the distance between them? We can refer some gravity into the uh, like R two space and then compute the distance R two. Okay, we can do it locally. If we have two points that are actually in the same coordinate patch. And the coordinate patch is matched by a coordinate chart in the Euclidean space, and we can compute the distance there. But what if they lie in different coordinate patches? Connected, and I don't know, we can, depending on our taste, we can assume it's either connected or path connected. Most of the time they're really yeah. the same. Path connected. Yeah, so. So, so um, in, in the case, if you like to deal with yeah, path, path connected, connected, then we know there's a, a rectifiable curve that goes from P to Q. Can we, talk, can we define the length of the curve? Okay, how do we define the length of the curve? Um, here and here are going to be in different coordinate patches. Yeah. He's um, going to lie in a coordinate patch the, here. The, He's going to lie in a coordinate patch here. Yeah. Well, the curve lies in the space, so it has to be covered by open, by, by patches. Right, so we know the length of the curve in here. And we know the length of the curve in here. Yeah. But we don't know the length of the curve everywhere else. But we do know that we can, say, cover this point by a patch. This point here lies in a patch. This point here lies in a patch. <coughs> this point here lies in a patch. And so forth and so on. Each part of the curve that's being included in one of these green coordinate patches, we do know a way of computing its length. <coughs> On the other hand, a, a piece of the curve like this, we have two ways of comp computing its length. Because it lies in this coordinate patch, and it also lies in this coordinate patch. We know those two are connected by a translation. Exactly. Or two homogenous. So. Right. So the, the two different ways of computing the length of this interval are actually the same because they, the descriptions differ by an isometry. So this path has a well-defined length because we've used the Euclidean geometry <coughs> of the model space to define 
using the coordinate patches and charts, the um, length of the curve. And so from there, we can just define the distance of P and Q to be the infimum of the lengths of all curves gamma, where gamma is a path from P to Q. So this is a way, and then it's not hard. And that's a good exercise to show that this is actually a, um, this defines a metric space. So a Euclidean structure defines a metric space. What do we know about this metric space? Well, is the, the metric space, suppose we have a tiny little triangle. And we, well, we also, not only does it define a metric space, but the geodesics in this metric are, look like, or the short geodesics are going to be line segments. I think this is covered in the beginning of Rackless books. Right? <coughs> and we have a notion of an angle. This is just like that in R2. So if we have a small triangle, then in this metric space given by the Euclidean structure, it looks the same as in the coordinate system. So the Euclidean geometry, the metrics, is locally equivalent to Euclidean space. So the metric is locally Euclidean. That's already interesting because by this theorem that I mentioned above, the two-sphere has no Euclidean structure. So this, there's a, this, is, this is a very strong theorem in a sense because this just refers to the topology of the two-sphere. But this means that we can't have a geometry on the two-sphere where all of the theorems in Euclidean geometry hold true. So for example, on the two-sphere, and I'll close with this example, what are the straight lines on the two-sphere? Great circles. Great, great circles. And so what is a straight line? The straight line will be a geodesic curve of constant length, the um, shortest length, local length. And you can see that it, they, they exist. There are general theorems that these things exist, and they, they're unique. So the fact that you can reflect in a great circle, like the great circle being the equator, we can flip the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere to the top. Well, if you had a geodesic that was not on the great circle, connecting two points, then it's reflected <coughs> in the mirror image, but also be a geodesic, which would contradict uniqueness. A quick sketch of the proof of the geodesics of great circles. Now, we can cut the sphere into, by taking three great circles corresponding to the coordinate planes. So the xy plane intersects the sphere in the equator, Here's, say, the YZ plane and drawn in red. And let's see, actually, this boundary curve <coughs> here, which I'll recover in black, is a third great circle. They cut the sphere into three triangles. What's the angle sum of these three in this triangle? Well, what are the angles? They're all right angles. So we have three right angles, and they don't sum to 180 degrees. They have sum to 270 degrees. So here's a geometric difference between the sphere and Euclidean space or the torus. So this is a basic example, and 
tomorrow I'll describe more of the general theory of putting geometry on topologies and say more about them. Are there any questions? All right. Thank you.